Hi, and welcome to The Fix, a podcast about Photoshop, Lightroom, post-processing, and the cool and creative things we get to do with our images after the shoot. I'm your host, Sean Duggan, and on this week's show, we have the return of the book giveaway from Rocky Nook Press, where you can win any book that is currently available on the Rocky Nook website. Also, for beginning Photoshop users, we're going to take a look at the basics of working with layer masks in Photoshop. So, if you are a new Photoshop user and you've been curious about layer masks, wondering what they are, how to create them, how to edit them, and how to use them to apply cool effects to your images, this is a show for you. Don't touch that dial. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in and joining me here in my corner of thisweekinphoto.com. So before we get into the primary post-processing topic of this week's show, which is layer masking in Photoshop, I have a few news items to go over. Uh, the first news item is something that I mentioned in the introduction, and that is the return of the Rocky Nook book giveaway. There's a little bit of a difference though from the last time we did this. Uh, that was, I don't know, three or four, maybe five episodes ago, we gave away a book. And on that show, the book was a title that I chose just because it seemed to tie in well with the topic that we were talking about that week. On this week's show, you get to choose what book you want to win. Should you win, that is. Uh, and that is any book that is currently available on the Rocky Nook website. So you should definitely go over to that website at rockynook.com and take a look at what they have to offer. They have an amazing amount of titles, all sorts of topics related to photography. Just click on that bookstore link and peruse the titles that are there. Now, one thing I should mention is that some of the books that you'll see there have not yet been published. So just pay attention to the expected publishing date and realize that some may not be available at the present time. But once you get past uh, page one, uh, pretty much all of the books there are uh, currently out and available. And if you see one uh, like on page one there that is uh, a title that is of interest to you but is not yet out and it's something you'd really love to have, uh, if you win and that is the case, um, we'll talk about it. Maybe there's something I can do to uh, get your name on a list and have the book sent to you when it is released. So in terms of what you need to do to enter your name in to be considered to win the book, to throw your hat into the proverbial ring, as it were. <laughs> I guess this is the episode where I'm uh, throwing props around the room. Well, we'll see if that continues. We'll see if it's a trend. Uh, anyway, to, in terms of entering, uh, I will tell you what you need to do to enter at the end of this episode. So stay tuned, and I'll tell you what you need to do to get your name in to possibly win the book of your choice from Rocky Nook Press. All right, on to the next news item. And before I uh, go into this, let me just clarify that this show is airing on April 5th, 2016. And I am speaking to you from the past, very much like a time traveler whose voice is coming to you from across the void. Well, not really, but you have to admit it sounds good. Um, <laughs> I had some travel in late March, and so I recorded this episode a week and a half in advance of its air date. So it's airing on Tuesday, April 5th. I'm recording it on Thursday, March 24th. And on Thursday, March 24th, some interesting photography-related news hit the internet. Now, if you are a keen uh, observer of the photography scene on the internet, then you probably know all about this, and it's old news to you now. It's a week and a half old news, you know, even starting to get a little bit stale and musty, perhaps. But 
As I record this today on March 24th, it's brand new news. So I'm going to tell it you anyway on the off chance that maybe some listeners or viewers haven't heard the news yet. And if I can reach just one person, it will be worth it. So <laughs> the news is that Google announced on Thursday, March 24th, that the Nick collection of Photoshop and Lightroom photography plugins is now free. Yes, free. Capital F R E E, free. Now, that is a great deal because back when Nick was uh, an independent company, the entire Nick collection sold for about $500. And then when Google uh, acquired Nick, they chopped the price down and offered it for $150, which was a really a great deal. Uh, and now it's free, which is even a better deal. The only way that this deal could get better would be if Google gave me $150 to download the software and everybody. That would be cool, but somehow I don't think that that is going to happen. However, if you don't have it, you should definitely uh, head on over to the Google website and download it. You'll see a download now button there and you can choose whether you're downloading for Mac or Windows. And there, this is a series of really great, uh, very well designed plugins. Analog Effects Pro, Silver Effects Pro, HDR Effects Pro, Define, Color Effects Pro, Viveza, and Sharpener Pro. So it's just a, a great deal that it is free. However, it does raise the question of, well, why is it free? Does this now mean that they are going to, you know, cease development on it and no longer offer any updates? Does this hearken the end of life of the Google Nick collection? I certainly hope not because it is really uh, a great, several great pieces of software. And, uh, you know, one of the best, um, some of the best uh, Photoshop and, and Lightroom plugins out there. V very well designed, as I said before, great interface, great functionality. Uh, I hope it's going to be around. Uh, but um, I'm not sure because, you know, why are they offering it for free all of a sudden now? Um, it's too early to tell uh, as I record this here on March 24th what's going to happen. Uh, hopefully I will find out more and let you know in the future. Uh, for maybe more up to the minute uh, discussion of this, make sure you check out uh, This Week in Photo. Uh, the podcast with Frederick Van Johnson, and he, I know, will probably be talking about that on the next one. I'm not sure exactly what that date will be. Uh, it probably will have already aired by now by the time th this program airs. Uh, but, you know, check back on the recent shows to see which one um, they discussed the, this Google offer on. And perhaps by that time, he will have had uh, some new information and uh, if I hear about anything else uh, by the time this episode airs, I will put that on the website in the show notes. So that's the news there on that. Uh, definitely a good deal for photographers. You know, hey, free is one of the best deals you can get, right? Okay, next up. Um, somewhat in connection with our topic this week, which is going to be layer masks, I have a new lynda.com course out in my Photoshop composite project series, and it's called Shooting and Assembling a Sports Action Composite. So you've probably all seen those sports composites that show uh, the range of motion or a motion sequence of an athlete, uh, like a snowboarder or a skateboarder going over a jump, something like that. That is what this course is all about. And the great thing about uh, a sports action or a sports sequence composite is that when it's shot right, and uh, the images are all kind of done the right way. It really is one of the easiest type of composites that you can make. And I say that apropos this week's topic of layer masks because there is a lot of layer masking work in that course. So that is uh, new on the lynda.com front in terms of my courses there, and I will put a link to that in the show notes. And then one other thing to mention before we get into our layer masking tutorial is coming up in August, August 7th through the 13th, 
I have a workshop at the Maine Media Workshops on the scenic coast of Maine in New England called Creative Seeing, Refining Your Photographic Vision. And that is a workshop that is all about creativity, as the title would suggest. Uh, both creativity and creative seeing when you're out with your camera, uh, how to see images, composition, how to use camera controls to uh, create the photograph that you have in your mind. And then also back in the post-processing phase, how to use Photoshop, Lightroom, and some other software to really uh, realize your creative vision and finally uh, craft the, the finished photograph that you have in your mind's eye. So if you want to uh, get away from it all and indulge in your photography for a week, uh, that's going to be, again, August 7th through the 13th, 2016, at the main media workshops, and I will also put a link to that in the show notes. Alrighty, so onward to our primary tutorial here, uh, our demo section for the week, our post-processing uh, main course, as it were, on Photoshop layer masks. Now I'm gonna be diving into this from a beginner's perspective. So if you're already an old hand with Photoshop layer masks, just realize that I'm gonna be kind of covering some of the basics, but it really is one of the most useful things to know about Photoshop. And um, it's hard for me to get very far into a Photoshop file without layer masks starting to appear, you know, almost right away, whether that's in the form of a layer mask that I'm using in a composite image or layer masks that I'm using for adjustment layers to direct my color and tonal corrections to specific areas of the image. So this is a big topic. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have co-authored a book on the subject with Katrine Eisman and James Porto called Photoshop Masking and Compositing. Um, so we are only going to be scampering around on the tip of the proverbial iceberg as we explore this topic. We're not going to be going too deep. We'll save some of that for future shows. But if you are a new Photoshop user and you are interested in getting a little bit more conversant with how to use layer masks to improve your images with adjustment layers or create interesting compositing effects for multi-image collages and such, that is where we're headed next. Let's go. You know, when I did the last Rocky Nook book giveaway uh, a few weeks back, I asked listeners and viewers to leave a comment and provide a suggestion of a topic they'd like to see covered on a future episode of The Fix, or perhaps uh, a guest that they'd like to see interviewed, and that was how they, they entered the book giveaway. And one listener from Ireland, Catherine, uh, mentioned that she'd like to see a show with some beginner tips on compositing, where to start and some pitfalls to avoid and, and such like that. So, Catherine, if you are listening or watching, uh, thank you very much for leaving that comment. I definitely have a soft spot in my heart for Ireland, since that is where my father was from, and I've definitely had some good times visiting there. Look forward to going back soon. This show... Uh, here is not the show you're you're looking for, but there's a lot of parallel and a lot of overlap because compositing uses layer masks quite a lot. So even though this is not a show on compositing per se, I am going to be kind of touching a little bit on compositing in some of the examples that I show. So the topics that I'm going to be going over kind of... Uh, dovetail neatly into uh, what your request is, and uh, fear not, we will be going more into some beginner tips on compositing in another show. So let's get back to this example here. Speaking of masks, who was that masked man there? You know, whenever you find a mime in a mask with two white cats perched on his arms, you gotta stop and take a photo. There's just, you know, no way around it. So let's bring up the layers panel and just take a look at what's going on here. At the most basic level, a mask is just a way to control the visibility of what is on a layer. It allows you to show parts of the layer and hide other parts of the layer. Now this can be 
uh, image layers, such as we see here, or it can be adjustment layers where you are applying some form of color or tonal correction to an image. So I already have a layer mask here on this image of the cat mime. It's currently turned off, and I'm going to use a shortcut of holding down the shift key to click on the thumbnail of that layer mask to turn it back on. So you can see here I am using this layer mask to hide the background. And now, of course, I could take this picture of the cat mime and composite it into another photograph if I wanted to. Let's take a quick look at what this mask looks like, and that gives me the opportunity to show you another cool shortcut as it pertains to layer masks, and that is holding down the Option key on Mac or the Alt key on Windows and clicking on the thumbnail of the mask. And you can see that we have this really nice, very detailed mask, really good edges here. I'm not going to be going into how I created that mask. It was a combination of using a few different tools and some uh, mask edge refinement techniques. But what I wanted to show you here, and by the way, I just held down the Option key on Mac or the Alt key on Windows to click on that thumbnail to get back to the regular image view. What I wanted to show you is that in addition to masks that control the visibility of what's on an image layer, you can also have masks that control the visibility of an adjustment layer. So up here in this layer group, I have a curves adjustment layer with an adjustment that affects only the eyes of this cat, the cat whose eyes happen to be open. The other cat was sleeping. She'd had a very hard day playing to the crowds, doing lots of meowing and, you know, swishing her tail and whatnot. And she was just really tuckered out. So she was just kind of having a, a little bit of a nap. Who can blame her? I like a little afternoon nap myself now and then. Let's zoom up close to this so we can see the eyes of this cat better. And let me just turn this adjustment layer on and off here by clicking on its eye icon. So you can see that the eyes of the cat were a little bit dark and I just added a curve adjustment. You can see what that adjustment looks right there. And that just brightens up the eyes of that cat. And it also uh, adds a little bit more yellow into the eyes. If I hold down the Option key on a Mac or the Alt key on Windows and click on the thumbnail of that mask, you can see what it looks like. So that adjustment is only affecting the eyes of the cat. So the reason that I went in and delved into this here is just to cover the basics, what a layer mask is. Just controls the visibility of what is on a layer. And of course, once you have something like that in place, you can come and do a composite, such as this example here, where I took the very detailed mask that I had created for the cat mime and used it to add that cat mime into another image and create a composite view. So in terms of some of the essential concepts of layer masks to understand is what the colors of black and white mean. It's pretty straightforward. Black indicates the areas of the layer that are hidden and white is the areas of the layer that you can see. Handy little rhyme to remember that is black conceals and white reveals. So the black areas on a layer mask are analogous to the solid areas on a real world mask, such as a mask you might wear on your face. Those areas, the solid areas, they hide the face or they hide a layer on a Photoshop file. And then the cutout areas of a mask on a real world mask, they allow you to see through and you can see the face, or of course, if it's a white area on a layer mask, you can see what's on the layer. Pretty straightforward. Let's move on to talk about how layer masks are created. You can see in this file here, I have two layers. I have the seascape, and then on top here, I have this layer of a clock. Now the clock has already been cut out from its background, and it's surrounded by transparency. You can see that there via the checkerboard pattern there, which indicates transparency in Photoshop, transparent pixels, or I, I should clarify, uh, areas on the layer where there are no pixels. So layer masks can be created in a number of ways. One of the most common ways that they are created is by starting with a selection. 
So if I got my rectangular marquee tool, I could make a selection of the sky of the seascape image here, just coming down to the horizon level, the edge of the ocean there. And then if I come down to the bottom of the layers panel, there is this icon here. This is the add layer mask icon. And if I click on that, it will create a layer mask that shows the area that I had selected. So you can see that the bottom part of the clock is hidden by the layer mask. Again, uh, if you remember the, the little rule here that black conceals and white reveals. So the areas that are black in the layer mask are hiding the clock layer and the areas that are white are showing it. Now, let me show you another cool trick about creating a layer mask. I'm gonna undo that and let me just deselect this by choosing Command D. I could also make a selection of the area that I want to hide. So here I have just made a rectangular selection of the bottom part of the image, the ocean part of the image. And if I hold down the Option key on a Mac or the Alt key on Windows, when I click that Add Layer Mask button at the bottom of the Layers panel, it will hide the selected area. So that is a very useful shortcut to know. While I'm here working with this uh, very simple image here, let me get my move tool, I'll press V, and if I you know, click on this layer to move it around, the problem is, is that the mask moves with it. And so that obviously kind of breaks the, the visual effect that I'm going for. Let me undo that. But look over here in the layers panel, there is a chain link between the layer and its mask. That means that they are linked together, so if I move them, they will, they will move together. But I can unlink those simply by clicking on the chain link there. And now you notice that there's no chain link. So now with my layer thumbnail active, and let me actually just pause here for conceptual station identification. Um, when you're working with a layer that has a mask, you can either have the layer active or you can have the mask active. Notice that there is a highlight border around the active item here. So right now my mask is active. If I click on the layer, the layer is active. It's very important to keep that straight uh, in your mind so that when you're working uh, with layers and layer masks in Photoshop, you have the correct item on that layer active. Anyway, with the layer now active, I can move it and it is independent of the mask. So the mask stays in one place. So I could actually have you know the clock be like a setting sun here. Okay. Um, one other uh, thing to show you here, let me actually undo all of that, is that if you come up to the layer menu, there is of course a menu equivalent for those shortcut commands at the bottom of the layers panel, and that would be under layer, layer mask. Uh, you can either choose reveal all or hide all, or if you have a selection, you can either choose reveal selection, meaning show the areas that are currently selected, or hide selection. So the most recent shortcut method that I did at the bottom of the layers panel by holding down the option key on a Mac or the alt key on Windows and clicking on that layer mask icon at the bottom of the layers panel, that would correspond to the hide selection choice here. So if I chose hide selection here from this menu, you can see it's gonna give me that same, that same option there. One other cool thing to just kind of throw out here, and uh, I, I guess this sort of, uh, is somewhat of an answer or um, a, a addressing Catherine's request on some sort of basic compositing stuff is that blending modes, which you can find here at the top of the layers panel where it says normal, blending modes are definitely very useful in compositing. I'm not really going to go into them in, in any detail here in this episode, but if I chose multiply here, I get a really interesting effect where I can see through parts of this clock to the sky behind it. So we've seen so far that you can create a layer mask by starting with a selection. And if you just click on the add layer mask button at the bottom of the layers panel, the default behavior is that it will give you a layer mask that shows you the areas that you had selected. Or you could also hold down the option or the alt key and click on that same button and it will give you a layer mask that will hide the areas that you have selected. The main thing to understand is that black will hide a layer 
and white will show the layer. So there are a variety of ways that you can edit the layer mask or create a layer mask using those tones of black or white. Another way, in addition to starting off with a selection, is simply to paint on the layer mask. So I'm going to make my brush tool active here. I've got a pretty big brush selected and I've got uh, a nice soft edge and I have the opacity set to 30%. By the way, this um, display here of changing the size of the brush, I'm getting by holding down the Option and Control key on Mac and dragging side to side to change the size of the brush and up or down to change the hardness of the brush. And the, the Windows equivalent on that would be to Alt right click and drag left to right or up and down to change the size or the hardness. So I have this brush selected. Now before I paint on the layer mask, I do want to make sure that I do have my layer mask active. So again, look for that highlight thumbnail around the, uh, excuse me, the highlight border around the thumbnail of the layer mask. So with that active there, black is my foreground color, which means I'm going to hide. I'm going to just sort of paint along the bottom edge of the clock here. And again, I am painting at 30% opacity. And you can see that I am modifying the mask so that the clock appears to be gradually fading out here as it reaches the horizon. Now I just bump my opacity up to about 40% just by tapping the letter 4 on the keyboard. And so here's another way that you can uh, modify a mask. Now let's look at what that mask actually looks like now that I've edited it. I'm going to hold down the Option key on a Mac or the Alt key on Windows, and here it is. So you can see that here's where I have, I've added my brush strokes here. Let's go back down to like 20% here. So you can see I have a range of, of tones going from black at the very bottom, uh, getting progressively uh, lighter in terms of the tone of gray, uh, and then finally becoming white. Let me hold down uh, Option again and click on that thumbnail. So Another very important thing to understand about a layer mask is that we know that, of course, black will hide everything and white will show everything on the layer. Gray will show it partially. So you can see that I have these gray areas in my layer mask here, and that is showing the layer partially in those areas. The darker the tone of gray, the more it will hide the layer. The lighter the tone of gray, the more it will show the layer. And you can see that reflected here in how the clock looks. And this is actually kind of a, a very cool look. I really actually uh, am liking this quite a lot. So that is another way that you can edit a layer mask and achieve an effect that maybe you might not be able to get right off the bat with a selection. And let me also just actually set the blend mode for this clock layer from multiply back to normal because that also might make it really clear what the gray areas in that layer mask are doing in terms of how they are showing parts of the clock. So for instance, right now, I really don't want that letter, or excuse me, that number four to show. So I could paint over that very subtly uh, my opacity, again, is set to 20%, which is why I need to go over this with several different brush strokes. I am using a Wacom tablet and the stylus here to do this painting. Now, another very useful masking shortcut is that if you tap the backslash key, which is uh, right next to the bracket keys uh, on your keyboard, kind of one of the upper rows of keys, if you tap the backslash key, it will show you the mask represented by a transparent red overlay. So where you see, you know, the overlay down below where it's, you know, fairly solid, uh, you can still see through it, but it's fairly solid. That is where it is black in the mask. And then obviously as it becomes grayer in the mask uh, and then fades to white, that red overlay color becomes more and more transparent and then finally fades out. So you can see that right up here, you know, around the number three, it's a much uh, more uh, muted and faint and, and kind of dim red overlay than it is down at the bottom. So again, that is sometimes uh, useful because sometimes you do need to be able to see the mask and the image 
at the same time as you are editing it. And the way to see that is to just tap the backslash key. And that's just kind of like an on and off toggle. So I just tapped it again, it turned it off, tap it again, it turns it on. Now, of course, if you have inadvertently uh, hidden too much of the layer uh, on the mask by painting too much with black, uh, you can reverse it simply by exchanging your colors. So if I come over here to my tool panel and I uh, click on the curved arrow to exchange my colors, or I could also just simply tap the letter X on the keyboard, it will exchange the colors. And now I'm painting with white. So I'm going to bump my opacity back up to 50%. Now remember, white is going to reveal. So if I paint on the layer mask with white, more of the clock is going to come back here. So it's it's a, a process that you can uh, always go and uh, modify simply by painting with white or black to uh, adjust the mask to get the image looking the way you want. Let me just undo that. All right, now we're going to move on to uh, another image and we're going to talk about adjustment layers with layer masks. I did want to start off with these sort of very simple composite images just because I think that uh, when you're compositing two different images together, it really makes it very plain and clear how the layer masks are affecting the image. But let's move on to a different image and apply some tonal and color adjustments to it. This image is a photograph of one of the marvelously monumental Art Deco uh, sculptures, bronze sculptures, that can be found at Hoover Dam along the um, southern Nevada, northern Arizona border. And I just really just love the style of these. They really kind of capture uh, the time in which that dam was created, which is, you know, the uh, early 1930s. But what I'd like to do is apply some adjustments to kind of separate the statue a little bit more from the background. I want to darken down the background and maybe also apply some saturation and contrast adjustments to the statue. And adjustment layers with layer masks are the ideal way to do that because they are non-destructive. And of course, once you get into Photoshop, it's important to work non-destructively as much as possible because that gives you the flexibility to undo things, to go back and change things, and never uh, irreversibly or irrevocably change the underlying pixels in the image. Of course, if you're working in Lightroom, uh, all of the Lightroom process is non-destructive, and uh, there are ways that you can apply localized adjustments, such as I'm about to apply here in Photoshop, uh, in Lightroom, but Photoshop gives you a lot more uh, precision masking tools. So uh, if you're using Lightroom and you're wondering, well, when should I go into Photoshop? You know, for me personally, I do most of my work to my images in Lightroom. Uh, when I go into Photoshop, it is typically for a fairly specific reason. Um, it might be that I need to do uh, some more precise or intricate retouching that I can accomplish using the retouching tools and functionality in Lightroom. Uh, it might be that I want to make a composite. And obviously I cannot do that in Lightroom, so that's going to necessitate a trip into Photoshop. Or in terms of masking, it could be that I just can't create the type of precise mask that I'd like to create uh, using the masking tools, the local adjustment tools in Lightroom, and I need to go into Photoshop. So those are some of the reasons why I might choose to go into Photoshop. So let's get started here with this. I'm going to first get my quick selection tool. And I'm going to just drag along the rock areas of the picture here to start a selection of those rock areas. Now the great thing about the quick selection tool is that it is ideal for any selection method where there's a clear color, tonal, or contrast difference between what you want to select and what you don't want to select. And that certainly is the case here. You can see we have uh, an obvious color difference between the uh, green bronze statue, uh, as well as you know a nice contrast edge along uh, the edges of the statues uh, as well. So I'll come over here to the other side and start dragging to select that. Now the way the quick selection tool works is 
it automatically, once you start to create a selection, it will automatically switch itself into the add-on mode, add to the selection. So you don't have to do anything or hold down any uh, modifier keys or click any buttons or anything like that. It'll just automatically go into the add to mode. All right, so there we go. That looks pretty good. Let me just make my brush smaller to get that one little bit there. And let me zoom out to make sure I have everything okay. That looks pretty good. All right, so now I have a selection of the uh, cliff wall in the background. I'm going to come down to my Add Adjustment Layer button here at the bottom of the Layers panel. And I'm going to choose Curves. And let me actually tear my Curves panel out here to make it somewhat larger so it's easier for you to see. And let me actually tear the Layers panel off too so we can see that at the same time. There we go. Make that picture a bit bigger. All right, so what I want to do is I just want to darken this down. So I'm just going to pull down on the curve to darken down that wall in the background. I might kind of pull up on the highlight edge of that curve just to sort of increase the contrast of um, highlights on that wall. If I click on that little preview icon there in the bottom of the curves panel, we can see how that's looking. And obviously, right off the bat, that really does help uh, create a lot more visual separation. You can see here the layer mask that was created. If I option click on that or alt click, if I was on Windows, you can see what the layer mask looks like there. And remember, whenever you have a selection and you choose to either add a layer mask or add an adjustment layer, Photoshop will take that selection and turn it into a layer mask. And the areas that you have selected, will be rendered as white in the mask. The areas that you have not selected will show up as black in the mask, as you can see here. Of course, I had the uh, areas of the cliff selected, so they show up as white in the layer mask. All right, so that looks pretty good. One thing you can do, in some cases you might need to, there is a, um, if you have the properties panel up, and of course, when you're adjusting an adjustment layer, such as I am here with the curve, the properties panel is set to show me the curve or the adjustment layer controls. But if I click on the thumbnail of the layer mask, or I come and click on the little mask icon up on the properties panel, it gives me the masks panel. So that's another very important thing to understand about layer masks is that they have their own panel. Uh, one thing you can do them is feather them. And you can see there, as I feather this, that it is making the edge of that mask softer. Let's option click on the mask so you, can, so you can see that. So you can see it's going from very hard edge to, you know, much softer. And the great thing about that feather control is that it is dynamic and non-destructive. You can always turn the feather off and return the mask to its hard edge. The other control up here is... Um, Perhaps a little bit harder to understand and uh, maybe not used too often, but I actually find it fairly useful in a lot of cases, and that is density. The density slider refers to the density of the black tones in the mask. So if I lower the density, the black becomes gray. So what this would mean in terms of this adjustment here, of course my adjustment in, in the curve here, if we look at it, is kind of darkening those tones. What this would mean by lowering the density and making the black tones more gray is it means that the the statue would be partially affected by the darkening adjustment. Let's actually uh, option click on that thumbnail of the mask again and come back to look at that. So you can see that the statue is getting darker there a little bit because I've lowered the density to about 47%. If I return the density up to 100%, you'll see the statue is getting lighter because, of course, the mask is getting blacker in that area, which means that it is being totally protected from that effect taking place on it, the effect of the curve adjustment layer. So that's what uh, the density does. There are some other controls here. Invert, if you look at the mask thumbnail here, invert will just invert that. So now it is the statue that's being darkened and the cliff wall behind it is not being darkened. Let me set that back. And then we have mask edge and color range. Don't have time to go into those in this episode. Possibly on a future episode of The Fix we will dive into those. All right, let's do one other adjustment to uh, this image here. And what I want to do is I want to create an adjustment that 
modifies the color and the tonality on the bronze statue, but not the cliff wall. Now, of course, I could come and get my quick selection tool and, and paint and draw over the statue to create a selection of it, but I already have a mask that I can use here. So here's what I would do in this situation. I would employ what I call the two masks in one approach. That is, I already have a mask of the cliff wall, so it follows that the inverse of that mask will adjust only the statue, which is what I want to do next. So I'm going to hold down the command key on a Mac or the control key on Windows and click on the thumbnail of that layer mask. And that is the shortcut to load that up as a selection. So you can see here I have a selection of the white areas in that layer mask. I'm going to come up to the select menu and I'm going to choose inverse. That would be shift command I or shift control I on Windows if you want to do that via the shortcut. Now I have a selection of the statue. I'll come down to the Add Adjustment Layer button and I will click on that and I'll choose Curves. So again, when you have a selection active and you choose to add an adjustment layer, it will create a layer mask for you based on what you had selected. Since I had the statue selected, you can see that my mask is the exact opposite of the first mask that I created. So now I can create an adjustment that modifies just the statue. What I'm going to do is just kind of pop the contrast on this quite a bit, maybe bring down the, the mid-tones, but I do want to bring those, those highlights up a little bit. You can see how flat it is without that, but if I pop those highlights up a little bit, it gets really, you know, a, a lot more pronounced. I don't want to bring the highlights up too much because, you know, obviously this is getting pretty bright here, but I think a little bit looks pretty good. If I turn the preview on and off there, that looks very nice. So I think that um, obviously uh, layer masks are very useful in compositing and we saw some of that uh, in the beginning of the demo part of this episode. But probably the, the place that most people are likely, likely going to be using layer masks is with adjustment layers to apply uh, color and tonal modifications to certain parts of their image. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the show, it's really hard for me to get very far into a Photoshop file before I have uh, started to add some adjustment layers and layer masks to apply these more precise modifications. So there you have it, uh, the basics of working with layer masks in Photoshop. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this really is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Uh, I'll be revisiting these topics, layer masks and compositing uh, here and there uh, throughout the year uh, on future episodes of The Fix. In between um, shows where I have a guest or I do an interview with somebody. So make sure you uh, check back every week. We've always got uh, good stuff here on The Fix. So another thing just to mention about uh, working with layers and layer masks and composites and stuff is that I have uh, several courses uh, on lynda.com covering compositing, masking and compositing in Photoshop. I have a series that is devoted just to the Photoshop composite project. So if you go to the website, thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix, and you scroll down to the bottom to the kind of about Sean section, you'll find a link to my lynda.com courses there, and you can learn a lot more and uh, if you're a member and subscriber of lynda.com, you can download the exercise files and work along with me and do the projects yourself. So in terms of the book giveaway, to enter for the book giveaway, here's what you need to do. You need to leave a comment on the page for this episode. Again, that would be at thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix and find the page for this episode on Photoshop layer mask basics. Leave a comment and you can do uh, one of two things. One, you can uh, post an image that you have created using some of the layer mask techniques that you either already know or that you have learned from watching this episode. And please include, you know, a short little summary or description of what you did to uh, create the layer mask, how you made the selection, etc. You know, nothing too in-depth, just a, a quick little uh, drive-by overview. So you can do that. Or, as we did uh, on the previous book giveaway, you can leave a comment and tell me 
uh, what sort of topics you'd like to see covered in future episodes of The Fix, or if there are particular guests that you'd like to see interviewed and like to see them talk about their work, you can uh, leave that in a comment. So that is how you uh, enter in on the uh, the book giveaway contest. And we're going to do two weeks on this. So this show is going to air on uh, April 5th. And so two weeks from there would be April 19th. So uh, I will close the book giveaway on April 19th. You've got two weeks to leave your comment and then we will randomly select uh, a winner from everybody who leaves a comment, and we will be in touch. We do have a uh, kind of a moderated uh, discussion uh, mechanism uh, hosted by Discuss, so you do need to register for that. Uh, and, and that's important because that way we have an email address for you, and we can actually kind of get back in touch with you and let you know that you have won. And, you know, hey, if you win, you want to know about it, right? Okay. All right. Well, I think that that is it for now. Um, remember that you can always listen to the audio version of The Fix on iTunes, or you can also come to the website, thisweekinphoto.com slash The Fix, watch the video version, and there's also an audio version there that you can listen to and download as well. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks very much for watching. We'll catch you next week on The Fix. We'll